You may know them for their wood glues, but did you know Titebond also has a complete selection of construction adhesives? Designed for a variety of applications, Titebond's adhesives make any building or home improvement project a breeze with their high-performing and durable formulas. These adhesives are trusted by the professional, providing squeak-free subfloor installations, long-lasting retaining walls, and even fastener-free feature walls. Check out Titebond's construction adhesives at tightbond.com, including their newest award-winning adhesive, Tight Grab Plus. We will forever see new products introduced to home building. We will always have to learn how to use them. So the refinements will not end. Hopefully we build low risk houses for with what we know right now, learn from, you know, mistakes, you know, take that knowledge forward. I think that's the name of the game. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Fine Home Building Senior Editor Brian Pontalillo. Hey everyone. Fine Home Building Editorial Advisor Mike Gurton. Hello. And our producer, Andres Samaniego. Yeah. Please email our questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, it is a pleasure as always to see you guys this morning. Thanks for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Mike, you've been busy. Uh, you were currently in Arizona, as I can tell, and uh, <laughs> you've had uh, a number of projects going on. Can you tell me what's going on there? Yeah, I haven't talked to you in a couple of weeks, so I've been just cranking away on stuff. I bought a, a uh, salvaged utility sink and, and faucet all in one and uh, made a, a spot in my garage to, to install that. I had done the trap and supply lines a couple of maybe a month month and a half ago so now i can clean up before i go inside and not track mud through the house or at least with hands mud mud on my hands and then i i had a it's a kind of cobbled together television uh near our our dining area and uh i mounted the tv to the wall with one of those extending wall mounts and then I needed a place to put a DVR underneath, and I made a floating shelf out of a scrap leftover piece of a hollow core door, where I <laughs> put a cleat. You know, well, the hollow it worked out perfectly because you know the hollow core door. It, it it's just a, a flat panel door, and uh, I could put a cleat on the wall. It was basically a a, a ripped down two by three, and screwed that on the inside corner so that it fit within the two yeah. layers of skins and then I could just screw it down from the top and the bottom and it's remarkable how strong that is once you mount it horizontally but, but and it's got a great job. like mid-century uh, aesthetic I gotta say it's very minimalist it's amazing yeah exactly like that, that, that's amazing I, I I I agree with you like I've done floating shelves that same way where you build a hollow shelf and slide it over a cleat and they are remarkably strong the fact that you pulled it off with a hollow core door is remarkable also, <laughs> well, um, like like probably most of us uh, in construction, I'm, I'm, I hoard leftover scraps of every little mm -hmm. thing that I think might be useful in the future, and this was one of those. Did things. you save I, the rest of the door, though? Is my question. Well, I well, this is what the the the, ben the beauty of this was the uh, where I'm sitting right now. I have a wraparound desk. Uh, it's like five feet in one direction and five feet in the other. And it's the hollow core doors that I had swapped out in the house last winter. So they make great desks. And the scrap piece that I had to cut off from the door is what I used to make the floating shelf. So I, I really saved it twice, salvaged twice. At the risk of getting too esoteric, do you think that having like salvage around is... Uh instrumental in the creative process like, like does that help you solve a problem you know that's a really i like that question because i think it does because you look at what you got mm -hmm. and you look at what you got to do and you see if anything matches in any any which way and in this case it did in a lot of cases it does yeah 
So Mike, I've I've I feel the same way, especially like I feel the same way when it comes to working on you know my own place, and and I you know I often am finishing projects with the scraps that I have laying around because I don't want to waste them. It it just you, like Patrick mentioned, you get you can just come up with creative solutions. But I'm curious, all, all of your professional work over the years, how often have you been able to incorporate uh, that kind of stuff into work that you're doing for other people? All the time. Yeah. Um, I've I've. That's why I have, fortunately, uh, I have a building that's about 75 feet long and 35, 36 feet deep. It's just a shed, and it's got two levels in it, and I've just saved junk from every job I've ever done. But, you know, I open it up to all my friends and family. So Mm -hmm. if they're doing a project, I say, hey, let's take a walk through my scrap building, and invariably they'll find something, you know, a half dozen two by six joist hangers that were left over from a job or something like that. You know, most of it's new material, but some of it's, you know, salvage like these doors. So yeah, works out. Mike also, Andres and I learned when we were shooting with Mike this fall that Mike also has a wheelbarrow museum. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, I, as I'm driving down the road, you know, I, I live in a community where people put out their trash the night or before. And so there's invariably in springtime and in fall when people do their clean outs, there's always uh, wheelbarrows. And it's usually just a flat tire or a broken right. handle. So yeah. I patch them up and I keep them around. And sometimes I have a hard time finding a wheelbarrow because they're out on loan to my brother or to my friend Addison or to some <laughs> other neighbor who grabs one of my wheelbarrows. It's like a community pile of wheelbarrows. Yeah, my current wheelbarrow you know, Mike, is actually... Uh, uh, I'm thinking uh, as a retirement plan, you could have like a lineup of wheelbarrows, much like a used car lot. I can just imagine them with like big signs on them that says, Cream Puff, New Tire. Yeah, and... You'll get to cho- talk to all the people yeah. who are shopping for a used wheelbarrow, too, which I'm sure would be interesting. Oh. Andres, what have you been doing? Oh, man, you remember that project that uh, I was replacing my vanity sink? It turned into a, yes. a two-bathroom project. So I actually wow. remodeled both bathrooms, one in my basement. I put a brand-new um, floating vanity there. The, the, uh, the plumbing was easier there because, you know, it, it was built recently. A few years ago, I mean, and, and um, I put a board and bat in, in the front. I replaced the, the mirrors. I ran brand new um, PEX lines uh, from the upstairs bathroom all the way to the basement. So I've been, re- I've been doing a lot lately. And uh, my next project awesome. is to um, try to insulate my, my garage so I can turn it into a, a shop because I couldn't find anything. <laughs> you know, another esoteric question. Uh, Carol and I have been talking about our own home improvements, and uh, it's way more enjoyable when you're not under the gun to get a bathroom back in service, for example. Do you find the work stressful, or is it enjoyable to work on your own place? For me, it's enjoyable because it, I step away from the computer, you know, as, as I'm editing a lot of videos here. Uh, I don't get to travel as much when, when I'm editing, so it's, it's actually good. It's, it's distracting, and, uh, you know, it takes your mind off of, of the computer or, and, or the work. You know, you're, you're doing something else. And I actually enjoy it. Cool. How about you, Brian? Do you use your home projects to uh, escape from the desk and computer? I use everything I possibly can to escape from the desk <laughs> and the computer. Um, for someone who, for someone who has you know worked at a computer for you know the better part of of twenty five years now. I really don't like being at the computer at all. So anything, anything that can get me away from it, like walking the dog, working on the house, like anything, um, reading a book that's written on paper. Um, and, and I think, you know, Chuck Miller told me a long time ago, and Chuck Miller, for anyone who doesn't know, is a founding editor of, of Fine Home Milling Magazine. And, you know, he said to me early on in my time at, at Fine Home Milling that it was essential that we kept... Um, working on projects. He said, it's the only way you will stay engaged, interested, and good at this job. And, you know, I took that to, I took that to heart, or I, well, I don't know if I took that to heart because there was also some necessity in the fact that I, you know, I bought a fixer-upper shortly after that. I had no choice but to work on my house. But I guess it's uh, better than saying I took that to heart. I, I realized pretty soon the value of that, of that comment. 
what's interesting to me is you are all nodding uh, in affirmation to what Brian was saying while he was talking about the importance of doing the, the handwork and uh, it's uh, how it keeps you focused and uh, in balance and understand the, the work that our customers and listeners are doing, right? I've been watching a great PBS series lately with Carol uh, Craft in America, and if you all haven't seen it, it talks a lot about um, making beautiful things, and uh, very smart people talk about their creative process, and you get to see the amazing things they make. Uh, two nights ago, we were watching uh, metal uh, metallurgists and people who do metal fabrication, and it was absolutely fabulous. So if you get a chance, totally check that out. What's uh, the name of enjoy uh, Craft in America, Mike. Well, on somewhat of a less glamorous note, uh, I got a visit from Carol when I was working on another project, and she said, uh, I just Googled why our washing machine is not draining, and it said that the hose is obstructed or the drain might be plugged, and I said, there's a third distinct option, and that's the pump has failed in the washing machine because we've been down this road before, and uh, this is now the second time in three years I had to replace that, and... Uh, uh, it's a good bang for the buck project, I gotta say, though. I was able to buy the pump for $20 from Amazon, which might be an indicator of why it failed three years <laughs> later, but it's impossible to get one any other way in a timely fashion, so uh, that's what I did. And I tried to buy what they described as the upgraded one. Uh, maybe the upgrade was a different electrical connector that uh, would plug it into the washing machine, and I thought about, you know cutting the one that was off the washing machine and rewiring this thing but you have to put it all together to then test it you know because it has a, a circuit board and all these parameters have to be satisfied the door has to be closed there has to be water in it you know it has to be uh you know x way at far into the cycle anyway so i couldn't test it so i had to buy the normal one once again and which delayed it a day or two but uh for 20 some dollars the thing is up and running again so if you all have a washing machine that's not pumping out and you determine it's the pump, it's not a hard repair even for a front loader. That's good to know. And and, and I'm glad you brought up uh, laundry projects because I should mention, since I've been, since I've been uh, talking about this for months and people probably think that I don't get anything done, I should mention that I did outfit the, uh, the laundry closet this weekend with um, a platform. I raised the front loaders up off about... Um, uh, about 11 inches off the floor and I built a shelf above them um, and you know that was that project which seemed like you know it was one of those things where it, it was it was a, it felt a little clumsy to use we have compact front loaders so they're very low the you know the, the door is very low to the ground and it felt a little clunky to use them but it was also like you know do I really need to do this well first time I just you know went to hit the power button on the front of the thing I was like oh this is much better this is much more comfortable totally worth it if you're building planning a laundry closet for front loaders I totally recommend getting them up off the off the floor a little bit I totally agree because I've been in that scenario too even with the full size ones yeah. it's very low yeah well, it delights me we're all working on stuff because, uh, as Brian suggests, it helps uh, stay grounded in the craft. Um, this comes from Peter. And thank you all who, who wrote in with questions or feedback. Once again, I, I really appreciate it. It does make this show so much better. Uh, good morning from Boston, podcast crew. I thought you'd like a book recommendation. On this nearly five-year-old episode, you discussed the Saskatoon Super Insulated House by Harold Orr. I recently checked out every book from my local library on high-performance building, including one true gem in particular, the aptly named Super Insulated Houses written in 1981 by William A. Shercliffe, an esteemed physicist who lived nearby me in Cambridge, Mass. He even lists his home address in the introduction in case you wanted to correspond him with an actual letter on written on paper. <laughs> I'm going to put that address in the uh, show notes in case anyone wants to write to Dr. <laughs> Shercliff. Uh, the book look, looks like it was hand-typed by Shercliff himself, and my wife says, I need to put the cover design on a T-shirt. Surely a million-dollar idea. I'll put a cover of the book. I'll put a photo of the book cover on the podcast page because it is truly amazing. Um, a lot has changed since 1981, like email, which I'm using to write you this digital letter, not on paper. 
But flipping through the book, there isn't much we are doing today that hadn't already been said 43 years ago, which is actually quite depressing. See the wall section of a typical concept construction low energy house image attached. The permanent wood foundation with two layers of exterior insulation from footing to roof, R20, R18 cavity insulation, R60 attic insulation, thermal brakes, continuous interior air barrier. Today we'd swap the insulation wing at the footing, unless it's a frost protected shallow foundation for sub slab insulation and use a smart vapor retarder instead of six mil poly, but it's pretty darn close. Among other topics, he writes about using electric over combustion appliances, ventilation, staggered stud walls, double stud walls, passer solar heat, air changes, humidity, as well as energy retrofits, and really nerds out on numbers and details. The best part by far, though, is the case study on the locale houses. Maybe this is how it all gets sold to the masses. Low-calorie houses. A carbon-neutral house could be sold as carb-free. Sure, Cliff was certainly far ahead of his time. Anyway, to bring this rant full circle, they have a section on the Saskatoon house you mentioned in the podcast, and I thought you'd enjoy Sure Cliff's details and illustrations on the house. It's worth checking out from your library if you can find a copy. Peter... Thanks, Peter, very much. Did you guys see uh, Dr. Orr's uh, Saskatoon uh, low-calorie house? Yeah, what okay. do you think, Brian? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I, I think that I have the same, I very often have the same experience um, that he had when I, when I you know, have to do research for an article or a, on a building assembly, um, and I find out that, you know, someone was doing this, um, often Mike, you know, 40 years ago. And, um, and so, you know, it is, it, it is, you know, that it is true that like a lot of what we do today isn't new, but you know, the refinements are important. You know, he mentioned, you know, use not using uh, polyethylene vapor barrier, but instead using a, you know, variable perm vapor retarder. So the, like, I think these refinements are important and, you know, I, with, with like material science and and um, well with all science really, but even just the uh, just the fact that you know we will constantly we will forever see new products introduced to home building. We will always have to learn how to use them, so the refinements will not end. You know, hopefully, hopefully we, um, you know, hopefully at, at best we 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 build low risk. As, as best we can, low risk uh, houses for with what we know right now. But we're also not afraid to try things, learn from learn from you know mistakes, um, and then take that you know take that knowledge forward. I think that's the name of the game with uh, really improving the quality, efficiency, durability, all that of, of our homes. Before I go to Mike, I can't help but notice you didn't answer my question about Doctor Orr's uh, locale oh. house. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I like that. I love that idea too, and it reminds me of something I was I was working on this story on indoor air quality, and I was referencing my experience with an indoor air quality monitor that I have called the Wave Plus that you wave your hand over, and it either gives you a green, yellow, or red uh, light, so that in a, in an instant you can know whether there's a problem with your indoor air quality or not. And I thought, like, how do we get you know homeowners and builders who don't know about indoor air quality to take it seriously? And I thought, give him one of these because the red's alarming. Yeah. When you wave your hand over it and you see that red, you think, what the heck, you know, what, what's going on here? I got to figure this out. So putting it in the terms of low calories, as opposed to like the, all these other, you know, terms that only builders or architects or building scientists use, you know, for the average person, I think is a great idea yeah. or something similar. Yep. That's what, what it's think, all Mike? about. Simplify. What do I think? Of, well, you know, it was it was like a blast from the past. I think I remember reading the book back in the or in the eighties because a lot of that high, that first wave of high performance home building back in the late seventies, early eighties was all based on energy consumption because the prices of 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 energy, both gasoline, oil, uh, natural gas, everything like doubled, tripled within a couple of years. And so everybody all of a sudden started paying attention to, oh my gosh, my, you know, my utility bill just went from, you know, $10 a month to $40 a month or something like that. So, and, and, and I don't remember taking note that there's a parallel between, you know, the, the pretty good house today and what was being promoted, at least in the case of this book back then. But I do remember working on houses that were the first three high performance houses that I worked on weren't my own projects. I was just a lowly laborer carpenter at the time, but 
just being amazed at what they were doing and, and how different it was from, you know, the houses on either side of them. And, and now, you know, again, like, like, uh, like he points out, uh, like Peter points out that not a whole lot's changed, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Andre said, you know, that we were talking about, uh, you know, similar concepts back in the eighties that we're still talking about. <laughs> you know, it reminds me of uh, it reminds me of uh, the article that I, I was in our last issue that I wrote on Larson trusses. Right here's an idea that comes yeah. from the late seventies, early eighties. That um, you know, it was uh, John Larson was building these trusses, shop building these trusses, and taking a lot of care to rip two by fours into two by twos and dado the two by twos to insert these gussets and you know. Um, but the idea lives on with, and people are, you know, calling the lumberyard and ordering eye joists or, you know, open web floor trusses to do it or just coming up with unique ideas. But, you know, in 1980, you know, John Larson knew what he was doing and, and it all made perfect sense. And, um, you know, so it's just, it's refinements on that idea. Yep. Well, to come back to Dr. Orr's house, I'll say what Brian so delicately avoided saying is that it's an amazing house. It is also <laughs> impossibly ugly. <laughs> uh, this comes from Landon. Hello, folks. Been listening to the FHB podcast daily for about 45 days now. My wife and I are in the midst of restoring a 2,800 square foot, 1963 mid-century split foyer in East Tennessee. And since efficiency is one of my key goals for this house, it's been wonderful listening. Thanks for sharing all the examples, insights, and ideas. In episode 593, Jim writes in about staining on his fiberglass fixtures, electrolysis, and grounding. While I don't know a ton about these subjects, I did want to offer this. While running the plumbing through my house, I discovered there are some lines in the trunk and branch system that are copper, while PEX has been used to update in some areas through decades older models and improvements. When you were talking about Jim's house, I immediately began to wonder about the age of his home and what kind of visual access he has to his plumbing. Having a basement with a split foyer allowed me to see most of my copper pipes but very little of the PEX, which was only found after a complete demo of a bathroom and a few other walls. Some homes may only have visual access in a utility room, and as old homes go, sometimes it takes digging in to find out more of the story. Perhaps there are lengthier sections of copper that are carrying out some electrolysis and could be grounded, only they are not visible from whatever utility room the water heater is in. It's a long shot, but I always love a good Sherlock Holmes investigation, so I figured I'd share. I'm sure I'll be writing in more frequently as our project is only 45 days in, but wanted to open up the line, the line early in this journey. Happy home building, and thanks for all you do. Well, thank you very much. Um, did you guys see uh, Landon's house? Yeah, mm -hmm. Landon is knee-deep in a remodel. Uh, Mike, do you want to describe what he's got going there? Well, first off, the house itself, I mean, that, that design, even though it, it looks like a in some ways like a conventional what i would call a raised ranch or you patrick have referred to as a split level it's just got a few design features from the era like a wraparound deck and the overhangs on the roof with the timbers coming out the gable ends that gives it charm that a lot of plain old raised ranches don't don't um but yeah you can see where the inside of his house is all gutted out and uh and he's retaining the old, I can't tell if they're oak or fir floors, maybe oak, the old fireplace. So you can see through all the stud walls. So he's got a lot going on. Then he's got a whole bathroom all ripped out with the floor, all the old diagonal floor planks all cut out so he can put in some new plumbing. So yeah, it's pretty extensive what he's tackling. The fireplace has an amazing uh, brick pattern from the era. It's not running bond. I don't yeah. know what you call it, but the bricks are like stacked mm -hmm. on top of each other without, yep. you know, over yeah. uh, offsets. It's cool. Yeah, it is. Well, Landon, I hope you will keep us posted on your project because it looks amazing. And I really, really uh, admire your ambition because uh, I'm sure it's been backbreaking. What do you guys think? <laughs> I don't think he's I living there well, during the process. 
It doesn't look like yeah. it, which is good good for him. Yeah. <laughs> I love I love ranches and I love these I love these ranches with the, like one of the nice things about a, a lot of ranches is that they, they they don't have a really strong aesthetic and so you can really you can you know I've seen like really great ranch remodels where the ranch became a really more of a cottage feel or more of a bungalow feel. This one does have a little bit of a mid-century uh, feel and look to it like that like that fireplace that Patrick's talking about and I love that shot of where the uh, where the wall is open between what I think might be the dining room and the kitchen and I thought like you know a real a real you know mid-century modern move he could do would be to you know frame that wall nicely and leave it open mm. you you guys have probably heard me say it uh, you know we do all this amazing stuff on the frame of the house and then cover it up with this all this other garbage yeah. i found very sad <laughs> yes <laughs> um this comes from uh justin from bloomington indiana hi fhb gang i'm a huge fan of the podcast and magazine and have been an all access member for years well thank you justin uh, lately, I've been contemplating an unorthodox build and would love for you guys to point out all the reasons I should stop. In particular, I've been thinking of building a vacation home inside a half-round barn. One of the primary reasons this idea is attractive is that although I really enjoy building, I don't like feeling time-pressured when building. So I would hire someone to build a half-round barn where I would be free to take my time to build the house without having to worry about rain and snow. I also really like the idea of having the bulk water barrier separate from the house because, among other things, it would be easy to spot leaks. I guess this approach is not much different than some barn dominium builds. However, I haven't seen anyone use a half-round barn. Further, although I can think of a bunch of cons, aesthetics, lighting, cost, they don't outweigh the pros. Relaxed build, simpler build as water management would be minimized, snow and fire resistance. Please point out why this is a bad idea. Thanks. Justin from Bloomington, Indiana. Oh boy, this is amazing. I love this question. Yeah. Um, can, <laughs> can someone first describe what kind of barn Justin is talking about? Because when I read it, I imagined something very different than when I saw it. So what you're looking, what, what, what the photo shows is a, basically a Quonset hut. Um, if you imagine the inverted U, and it's just giant corrugated panels which go from it's like, it's like a rainbow. It goes from the ground way up high, and it goes down to the other side. And these are done mostly for agricultural buildings or for utility or storage buildings. But what Justin's proposing, and, and it wasn't clear in the way he describes it, is you could take this structure, and then you could actually outfit it with gable ends and, and make that your finish on the inside. But what he's proposing is to put one of these structures up and then build an entire house with a roof inside of the barn shape. And on, I think it's I-40 in, I don't know, one of the uh, Great Plains states, if you're driving down the highway, there's one of those situations. And I been meaning to pull over on the highway when I'm driving across country and take a picture of it. So somebody put up an ag building, built the house under, and I thought, what a perfect situation. Your the house is never going to see weather. If you get a leak in that main structure, what's it going to do? Dribble on the roof, and then you got your regular roofing there. You're protecting it from the sun, and uh, yeah, it's it's like a perfect perfect situation. And on the flip side, you could also think of it, and I don't know if Justin's thinking of it this way, is you could put up the the, uh, the the agricultural building, the steel building. You could build your house within it so you're out of the elements. And then you could remove all of that superstructure on the outside and then set it up adjacent as an actual barn. So you could uh, use it either way, either temporarily or permanently. Brian? Well, it reminded me that when I, in the, in the town that I grew up in, in Guilford, Connecticut, um, Someone did something similar um, with a remodel, uh, and I don't know that I don't know who did this, who did this. And I just remember being fascinated by it as a kid, as we would drive by all the time. There was a really small house on a property, and they built a really big shed roof over the monoslope uh, shed roof over it, uh, self you know supported by you know uh, like a post and beam type of structure. And then they started remodeling their house, and they eventually remodeled the house up to this roof. Oh, cool! And the roof became the roof, and the roof became the roof of the house. And there, I mean, for for some for you know for an owner builder, there's some brilliance to this idea, right? 
you know, because you are protected from the weather, you know, you're working on a project that's going to take you longer than it, it li likely, if you know, it's going to take, unless you're full time on it, likely it's going to take you longer than if you had a professional builder working on it. And so there's some, there's something really smart about that idea. Um, and I think this is a very simple and quick way to get that to get that protective structure up. Uh, Mike, I didn't think of Mike's idea of using it temporarily and then moving it. I started to think like, how do you, how do you design the, the, you know, the gable ends for lack of a better term to look right underneath this curved <laughs> roof? Like what is that aesthetic that you need to have there if you're actually infilling it into the roof, which I think is, it could be a cool, you know, a cool exercise in design. And I'm sure some people would have some great ideas for it. Um, you know, other than, other than being different and having, I mean, if you were go, if you were, if it was not going to end up your roof having an additional cost, I think I don't really think of a downside. Nope. You know, Andres, uh, you want to be the arbiter of uh, what? Is this a good idea? Do you think you would do this? I'm not sure. I mean, it's it is about fourteen thousand dollars extra to your budget. So, I mean, if you have the time to just you know hire someone to do it quickly and then take over from there. I think that's a, a better idea than, you know, spending extra to, to kind of do these extra steps. I so spend saying. the money, the 14 grand you'd spend on this building, and I'm sure you'd have a uh, cost to put it up too, right? I, you know, I think the 14 grand is just Correct. for the, the, the Quonset hut itself. So yeah. So, yeah. I, mean. I, I think you guys are all off base. So uh -oh. what I would do <laughs> is put up the Quonset hut first. And live in it, as Mike suggests, while you build a house. You could take as long as you want. You know, how long can you stand living in this uh, ag building? It would be the question. But, you know, you could only work on nice days. You could then turn the thing into a shop when you're done, which is what I would really want in the first place. I might never leave the Quonset hut would be what happened. <laughs> uh, and just keep making that nicer until I, you know, died. Anyway, I don't know. It's a great idea. Well, and it reminds me it reminds me of someone else who wrote in not too long ago and asked about whether they should I think they asked whether they should remodel a building on their property or just or just buy a trailer. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, you could also just put up this roof and then put a trailer underneath it and <laughs> put out some put out some patio furniture and go on with your life. Yeah, and take up a hobby inside the, the Quonset hut, right? Yeah. Outside the trailer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what a what a fun idea. Steven, I, I hope you'll keep us posted and you know, what the, the one thing I thought about was like, if you put this thing up over your build, you have an amazing tie off point for uh, safety lines, for lifelines, uh, for the rest of the build. So, you know, maybe that alone uh, would be reason enough to do this because I can guarantee a trip to the ER is going to cost more than 14 or 20 grand, uh, no matter what happens to you. I think I'm going to borrow Justin's idea, though, because I'm. Like I've mentioned a couple times on the podcast, I'm planning to build my own house in the next year or two, and I know it's going to take me a couple of years to build. So I might just put up this structure, build my house inside of it, even though it's going to be another you know, 15 grand, because then I can take that building, move it to my mother's property next door, and abandon that 75 by 36 foot building where I've got all my stuff stored now, which is about to collapse, and put it all inside of here. <laughs> Uh, I love it. I, Justin uh, in Bloomington, yeah. I hope folks will write in about Justin's project and uh, let us know what they think because it seems like a pretty good idea for sure. Yeah, I do. agree. Uh, this comes from Stephen. I have a flashing question where the porch meets the brick veneer. The laminated shingle roofing on the porch needs to be replaced. And the existing wall flashing and step flashing are covered by a layer of shingles that were nailed through the shingles, flashing, underlayment, and into the roof sheathing. How can I properly flash this roof to the sidewall connection without removing any or all of the masonry veneer wall material? Obviously, the nail holes in the flashing will present a problem when I remove the old shingles, especially since the holes line up with the holes in the underlayment and sheathing. The masonry veneer is in direct contact to the roofing materials, so there's no opportunity to slip new flashing beneath and behind the veneer. So briefly, uh, Stephen has a uh, shed porch roof and a brick veneered house, and someone put uh, sidewall flashing that laps over the high side of the roof and makes the transition between the brick veneer and the roof shingles. And Mike, you seem to have a, a pretty ready solution to this when we uh, talked briefly about it via email. Am I right? Well, I, my suggestion is... Um 
to uh, Diami, um, who's written who's written many articles for fine home building, um, has a solution which is you just it, it, around a chimney. It's the same situation. Masonry brick veneer is just cut into the the mortar, uh, cut a kerf with a grinder, and then insert new flashing instead of trying to reuse or repurpose the old flashing, which is, like he mentions, is going to be damaged. Plus, the the, the original flashing wasn't really done properly because it should have been laid into a mortar joint. So I almost wonder if this was like a retrofit and somebody just cobbled it together um, haphazardly. But I think the easiest solution is just to refer to a couple of the articles that Diami uh, has done, and it just shows grinding out, in, putting a little reverse hem on some flashing, like copper flashing, and then inserting it into that kerf, and then putting in a good sealant to seal it. What do you think, Brian? An easy fix, hard fix? Why was this built this way in the first place? I didn't, from the photos, I didn't understand why that, why it was where, where it was, why it was just in that spot. Um, where where he shows in the photos i didn't i didn't totally get that so i think in the one photo and this is for a clarity for the listeners too uh he peeled up the shingle to show us what he was dealing with i think on the rest of the roof uh the shingles still are covering that piece of flashing so mm -hmm. it's lapped incorrectly gotcha. at, his, at his starting point i got gotcha. you right yeah I, I i mean i thought of um I, I, another uh, chimney flashing article that we had wasn't Diami that had some had a similar detail, and that's often how counter flashing is done on chimneys, yeah. right? So um, it's sort of taking the counter flashing approach to this. So I think that's a great solution. I, I can answer. I think why this was done this way in the first place is my guess the roof was done before the brick veneer, which seems like a you know uh, mm -hmm. a construction sequence oh. that I see sometimes, and I don't quite get it. But so the the roofer has to put the flashing on before the brick is there, which is why the brick is on top of it. And then yeah, the only question I had with that with that method it was like when you're dealing with a chimney, you have full width bricks. When you're dealing with vic brick veneer, you don't have, you, you know, you don't have uh, at your, the mortar is not going to be as thick. And oh, so well, not, it, it can having, be uh, full brick size bricks too veneer. In fact, it commonly is. So you think it, in this house that look? You think that looks like a full? Well, it's impossible to tell by looking at it, but I would say it's brick. more common than having the thin brick, at least in the vintage of this house looks to me. But you okay, know. okay, yeah. What do you think, Mike? That's likely full-size brick, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it again, it's hard to tell how it was all done. You know, maybe this porch was added after the brick veneer was on, and then they've cobbled somebody cobbled together the flashing by cutting into the brick. It, it's 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 without destructive investigation, it'll be hard to tell what's going on. But really, the solution is just go up your next uh, next uh, mortar joint caught in that slot and then put in some new flashing and good to go. Yeah. And we'll put uh, links to those uh, articles that Mike mentioned in the podcast page so folks can check it out and see how that's done. This comes from Evan. Hello, FHB podcast crew. Since the last time we corresponded, I purchased a house in North Carolina. It's an old house from 1949 and came to me with a laundry list of things to work on. I was made to anticipate the chimneys needing to be cleaned, but when the sweep arrived, they found no soot, carbon, creosote, or otherwise, in either flue. The technician did point out to me that the fireplace was missing a damper. It was not parged in the throat. <clears throat> oh, my word. How much air and energy am I losing through this open hole? Okay, so I need to install a damper after parging the area above the fire block box. Well, how do I get that thing in there? As far as I'm aware, dampers are installed while the chimney is being laid. Does anyone have a tip or trick for maneuvering this? Please see the attached photos that I took while exploring the chimney myself. I also noticed that there is a wood board near the mantle that is exposed on the inside of the chimney. This appears to have been installed by the masons to hold up the brick as a kind of lintel. In order to burn wood in the fireplace, I obviously need to remove this board, but now I have to support the brick above it in place. Should I screw a piece of angle steel to the bricks above the wood lintel and cut it out? Please let me know what you think. I've included here a few unscaled drawings to show the form of what I'm describing. Thanks, Evan. So I should tell listeners, first off, I emailed Evan right away to tell him not to put a fire in this fireplace until these things are remedied because you cannot start a fire in a fireplace that has lumber as part of its construction. Mike, do you think this thing was never finished is my guess, right? This was, uh, it's not done. 
No, it's not, because usually on the inside, you know, the mason would have pulled out the board, um, and there might even be a steel lintel already above the board, and they just put the board in there uh, for some other purpose. And then they would have parged the whole inside of that throat area uh, behind, you know, above the smoke shelf. They, they usually will parge it. Maybe, maybe not. Um, it's it's hard to tell in that era. Well, again, it's 1949, so maybe they didn't parge coat the inside of the, mm -hmm. you know, it, it might be all right. But, um, but yeah, it, it doesn't look like it's all completed. And uh, just on his 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 mention of the the the, uh, the throat damper, there's no damper in there. It's hard to retrofit those. Th that would have been placed in at the time when they was actually corbeling up the uh, the 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 the, the, uh, the chimney above the firebox. Um, but that's easy. That's the easiest thing to solve. That that's easily solved by putting a flue top damper. Uh, which are conventional, and many masons nowadays use those because they seal much better than an old-fashioned uh, or 19th century uh, cast iron style. I'm going to interrupt you, Mike. I'm sorry. Uh, can you briefly yes. explain what that looks like and how it works? So a flute top damper, and we'll have a, a link to an article that I did uh, a few years ago for Fine Home Building. It goes on the top of the flue liner on the top of the chimney. And it's a damper. It's just a little flapper is one style. Another style is a stainless steel cap, which, which raises up and down. It's spring loaded. And in both of those designs, there's a stainless steel cable that runs through the flue liner down to the firebox. And you have a little chain down there that you grab onto whenever you want to release it. You pull it out of its little keeper angle slot and then release it the uh, damper at the top opens up. They have very good uh, uh, urethane gaskets, high temperature urethane gaskets, so that they can handle the flue gases and they seal all the air as well as critters, as well as rain out of the, the flue. So it's a simple And it's worth solution. saying they do a better job than a throat damper uh, at Absolutely. sealing, right? Yeah, they do a much better job. Because throat damper is just a piece of cast iron and it doesn't really have a gasket on it. Um, but uh, as it, it's hard to tell if there's even a flue liner in from the photographs, if there's even a clay flue liner inside of the chimney. So I'm going to answer would... that because I asked that question of Evan okay. because that was terrifying to me. You, yeah. you need a liner in a, in a wood burning or a solid fuel burning fireplace that, you know, they're made of clay or stainless steel, right? And um, uh, I, I wasn't sure as you if this had one, and it does. Uh, he tells me above okay. the throat, it does continue with clay up to the top. So that's good. Mm -hmm. So then it gets down to removing the wood that's exposed and then putting a flue top damper on and maybe parge coating the inside with some high temperature mortar. So, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say on the show, we generally don't tell folks to be scared of projects, right? We don't, you know, t tell people to get in over their head, but this is definitely a project for a pro. Am I right? And you're yep. nodding your head. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You need a, yep. you need a good Mason to, to, to ha look at this and decide if it's going to be ready to be uh, suitable for putting a fire in. Otherwise you might want to get one of those electric logs or uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that could be done too, um, short of doing the electric fire logs is they have inserts that would go in a metal fire insert box inserts that can go in. And if those have an extension that goes up to the flue liner area, then all of that uh, combustible wood, as well as the uh, unparged uh, bricks on the inside, if they're not capable of handling the high temperature that you get in a firebox, then uh, it would isolate those areas that would be of concern. But yeah, either going to a fire a fireplace shop that sells all kinds of different amenities or attachments for fireplaces and or a mason um, because they're going to know what the current code is, even though this is built in 49. So it's not going to be the current code, but they'd be able a good mason will be able to bring up an older fireplace to modern standards uh, working within the existing existing work that was done in 49. Can we just remind folks that 
fireplaces are a terrible way to heat your house, right? It, it, you don't build a fire to heat your house because it turns out it actually, you know, sucks out as much air as heat as it's producing. So it, you, you start a fire for a different reason, but if, if you're looking to this to lower your energy bills or whatever, uh, I think you're on a fool's errand. What do you think, Brian? Well, I, yeah, that's that's interesting you say that because, I mean, I, of course – like many people love the the ambiance of a fireplace and a fire burning in a house and you know sitting right next to it and feeling the warmth um of it and uh i also thought like just get one of the just seal the fireplace off (laughs) or um get that wood out of there and install a wood stove that actually cranks some btus into your house install that with a insulated you know flu and uh and ideally, it has doors on it, right? Issues. So you can uh, look at the yes. fire and it keeps out it. the sure. cold when the thing is not working, right? Yeah. Evan, I'm with Brian. I say block it off and get the electric fireplace and, uh, you know, improve your indoor <laughs> air quality. The Gosh, one thing I did not anticipate about heating with wood, and I did for three years in this building, you know, at the beginning of lock, lockdown, we didn't have uh, anything outside of resistant heat, which gets pretty expensive to run. So I, for three years, I heated the place with nothing but uh, cordwood, and it makes a mess. Uh, it makes a mess when you bring the wood in the house. It makes a mess when you take it out of the rack and put it into the, into the, into the wood stove. It makes a mess when you have to clean the ash out of the wood stove. It, it is not a convenient way to heat. <laughs> Well, just piggybacking on the suggestion to, to, to brick it off and, and abandon it, if you're going to go that route, just capture the floor space and uh, just dismantle the whole thing from the top down. And then Sounds you easy. Can capture some floor space. It is. <laughs> I've, I've done it on a number of houses. When I Some of my rental houses, when I buy them, one of the first things I do if they have an old chimney like this that doesn't have a a combustion appliance in the basement that it's exhausting as I take it right out. I just get in there with a sledgehammer, bust it all down. Not only are there flashing problems at the top, but there's also all of the thermal penalties that you're, we've been talking about. Take it out of there and then got a few spots where we got some closet space. So can't, can't And then you can put that. those bricks in your shed and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've got a big pile of those. <laughs> yes. Oh boy, uh, this comes from Tom. What a great, uh, we got such great questions this week. I love uh, mm-hmm. our questions. Uh, this comes from Tom. I spent half my life working as a builder and remodeling custom homes, and of course, reading Fine Home Building. I switched careers in 1989, retired in 2012, and decided to try my hand at furniture building. So I've been away from construction for 30 some years, but still have a love of sawdust. Shortly after I retired, I ran into a customer I built a deck for in 1982 who told me he had finally replaced the decking. I remarked that 30 years was a pretty good life for an outdoor structure in Ohio. He said the structure was fine. They just replaced the deck boards. I recently saw him and he told me two years ago he had to replace it or doesn't so of the new floor boards that had started to rot and I asked why they didn't hold up as well as the ones that I had used. I asked if they were pressure treated and he said they were. I asked if he had anything setting on the floor that would hold moisture. He said no and added that they were rotting from the bottom up. His deck is about eight feet above the ground, so I had no good answer for him. I listened to a lumber industry podcast to try and learn about hardwoods, and the host mentions that chromated copper arsenate is no longer used in treated lumber. Is this the reason the new deck flooring didn't last half as long as the original? Is there any treated lumber that would last 20 years? I want to build a deck on my house, but don't want to waste time and money on something that's going to rot away in 10 years. Would ground contact lumber last longer above ground than lumber treated for above ground use or as long as CCA lumber? Is there an alternative at gra- around the same price point as the treated lumber I can find at Lowe's, Home Depot, and the rest of it holds up like CCA? I think I could build block walls and pour concrete for the cost of ePay. I'm too many years away from the construction industry to know what's available. I understand the reason for taking CCA off the market, but I need a cheap equal. When I built the above deck, CCA was the cost-effective option for framing and flooring. We used some redwood and cedar, but at twice or more the cost. Thank you very much in advance for your help with this project, Tom. 
Mike, you've been nodding this whole time, and this is something that you and I have talked about. Yeah, go for it. <clears throat> the yeah, there's some of the newer treatments. Now, it, 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 Tom didn't mention when the customer redecked the deck. If there was a period of time when CCA was uh, taken out of the residential market, it is still available but it's not sold through residential lumber yards that would be built into houses. It wasn't banned. Some people think it was banned. It's still used for industrial purposes and marine purposes. And uh, I, I might, marine construction, if you really want CCA, as I understand it, if you go to a lumber yard that specializes in marine construction, that's where you can find yep. this stuff. Yep, exactly. Um, and, and I won't go into what the issues were with it, um, but... It, it did last forever, and every time I take apart an old deck, which was done with CCA, I save all those boards because they're going to last another 100 years. And, um, but the, the deck boards, there's a couple of different formulations you can find for decking, you know, the five-quarter by six deck boards. Some of them are they're, they're above-ground contact. They meet a certain specification for the American Wood Preservers Association. But you can find that sometimes in some climates that they will decay a lot quicker. So I think for Tom, what you can do for your own deck is do as you suggest and get uh, the ground contact lumber, which is an, an uh, that would be the UC, use category, 4A. That's going to be your ground contact lumber. If you want to go to a little bit better grade, which is heavy-duty ground contact, that's UC4B. Both of those would be available, and they're going to be you're going to mention they, they'll be uh, they'll be labeled as ground contact. Using those above ground, you'll be probably fine for a long period of time, especially with the formulations they have currently. There was a period of time like between 2003 and maybe like 2006 or seven, where those formulations weren't dialed in and the penetration of the chemicals wasn't that good and there was a lot of rotting decay of the pressure-treated lumber. But that's pretty much been resolved with most of the chemicals they're using today. So just go with above-ground contact, excuse me, ground contact lumber for both the framing and the decking and you should be fine. I'm sure there are listeners who are uh, wondering why we wouldn't suggest to use a uh, synthetic decking. Do you like those products? Do you think they are durable and good looking? You're asking me? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I go with wood <laughs> um, for a bunch of different reasons. I don't use uh, very many synthetic decking boards, and I, I usually use something else. Yeah. For cost, Mike? Uh let's let's save this for an after show how about that <laughs> um <laughs> i don't want to start down a, okay yeah i don't want to i don't want to start down a path and not be able to fully cover the all the, the issues but for for a price point deck for something that's reasonably priced pressure treated decking so, southern yellow pine you're going to have a, a good performance with a, a, a ground contact treated board. Um, if you want something that's an upgrade from that, then you've got cedar, you've got redwood, you've got a few other choices there with some of the exotic hardwoods that are sustainably harvested. Um, there are synthetics, yep, and a lot of people like them. Um, I'm just not enthralled with them personally, but that's, person, that's, that's, that's just a personal opinion. It's not from a, a performance standpoint. They do perform very, very well. What do you think, Brian? Well, I, I, I agree with Mike on the on the synthetic decking for one thing. It, it is it is it is purely personal preference, but aesthetically, I don't I don't just don't prefer the synthetic stuff. Um, I pref, I prefer wood, um, and you know, interestingly, I've had a similar experience with pressure treated materials, including ground contact rated pressure treated materials, mm -hmm. where I have seen it. Uh, fail prematurely and I so I wonder if it's a quality control thing hmm. um, I wonder if some boards just aren't you know the treatment just isn't isn't either done properly or taking properly or whatever whatever it might be uh, because you know even even an untreated board 
if it's if it's you know getting wet and drying out and it should it should last more than a few years mm -hmm. you know untreated lumber can last a long time outside um if there's not a you know if there's not a an issue that's creating rot um or put it's if it's not put in a situation to rot so i always wonder have wondered why you know you get these these get these sort of premature failures with any uh, pressure treated lumber. I mean, clearly, if you use something not rated for ground contact and ground contact, that would that's you know you're you're making a mistake there. But again, I've just I've I've heard about and even seen in my own experience a few like sort of premature failures that I haven't necessarily understood. Um, and in a couple of years, sounds like with any material, mm -hmm. a premature failure. And that's one thing to do with for anybody who's buying uh, lumber, pressure treated lumber, is there's all the little tags that get stapled to the end. Save some of those from the boards. If you buy a 4x4 four four or buy eight 4x4s, four four, save one tag from those. If you're buying a whole bunch of 2x8s or 2x10s, save a couple tags of those. And the same with the deck boards. There are warranties from the wood preserver for those products. I don't know what they are. They might be like a 10 year or a 20 year prorated. I haven't looked into them recently, but uh, you might be eligible for a warranty claim if there is uh, a problem, but you have to have proof of those particular boards uh, and those little plastic tags will be that proof. It occurred to me, we haven't, uh, we'll come back to this, but I want to plug the after show. Uh, <laughs> Brian mentioned that, uh, the know the code department on finehomebuilding.com and in the magazine is uh, a well a wealth of information uh, and uh, we're going to talk about in the, the after show some recent departments that have covered important issues related to the uh, building codes so uh, I hope you'll stay tuned for that and if you're already an access member uh, I hope you enjoy the show if you have other suggestions I hope you'll let us know what those are um, you know, interesting, my decks, uh, one gets a lot of sun, one is in the shade most of the day. Uh, they've held up similarly, I would say, with one exception. The guy who built the deck on the back of the house uh, did it when uh, the house was soon to be occupied by uh, Carolyn, Liam, and I. So it, it's uh, 2010 era. And the boards have held up really well, with the exception of this knucklehead decided to put a quarter-inch round over on all the deck boards. So the end grain... Uh, is uh, more exposed than it might be, and they've actually ground off much of the uh, pressure treating, uh, you know, on the corner of uh, the boards, and uh, those are those boards are rotting, which is no surprise to me because uh, he he in essence ruined it. So don't do that, please. It might look great, well, but use a piece of sandpaper. <laughs> you, know, bef you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge that because not 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 the the. the I would say go ahead and round it over, but getting to the after show and know the code, know the code. Anytime you cut or route or, or abrade or drill through pressure treated lumber, whether it's a deck boards or any of the framing lumber, you have to field treat those end cuts because that's the most uh, vulnerable, vulnerable part of those boards because that's where the water will get drawn in and that's where it's going to saturate a little more at the end of the boards. And that's where the pressure treating chemicals may not have penetrated as thoroughly. So by field treating, which is just taking some oxine copper, some copper naphthenate, which if you work, live or work west of the Rockies, you know that that's standard practice, but it's not standard practice east of the Rockies where we get southern pine. But you got to do that. And if you do that, even after your route, your boards will last a long, long, long time. Yeah, and, and one other one other thing to keep in mind is that uh, you know after after your pressure treated lumber dries out, um, you can finish it and you can rejuvenate pressure treated decks. Like I've I've made, uh, maintained a, a few of them over the years for myself and for some other people, and uh, you know with a with a with you know proper care and maintenance, um, you know you can really keep the pressure treated lumber looking good and lasting for for a, a long time. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, if you folks have experience with uh, pressure treating uh, per, uh, types lasting longer or not, I hope you'll share them with the podcast because I think it's an interesting discussion. Uh, when the switch was made to ACQ from CCA, there, there were a bunch of uh, hyperbole amongst the building community. I heard that uh, lumber 
uh, companies that were transporting units of these new materials, like their trucks were rusting out in two or three weeks. <laughs> That's just complete wow. bogus. That was just completely made up stuff. So, uh, yeah. So if you have real experience with these products, I would love to hear about it. Oh my gosh, so we're going to be talking about uh, minimum dimensions in the IRC, which relates to ceiling heights, room dimensions, uh, garages, what the special considerations are for building garages, fire separation distances, which is uh, on everyone's mind who lives in a wildlife, uh, wildfire uh, areas, and uh, habitable attics, uh, because uh, I like habitable attics, I love sloping ceilings and cozy spaces, so I decided we want to talk about that. So uh, I hope you'll stay tuned for that. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Mike, Andres, and Brian for being here, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. And it's been a long time, people, so I hope some of you will get on iTunes and tell them how much you like the show. Thanks very much for listening. Stay tuned for the after show.